started. My name is uh, Maximo Sarad Sadi. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for joining me today. Um, and I'm here to talk to you guys a little bit about why we have cultivated uh, Cubensis in the past as a society and how we have done it and how we do it. That's uh, how we do it now. Uh, that's going to be the main focus there. So a little bit about me, um, I'm a plant science uh, graduate from the University of Minnesota uh, with a uh, focus in breeding and genetics and uh, mycological novice, I like to consider myself. Uh, I had a short term career prior to COVID uh, with a culinary mushroom company in Minneapolis uh, known as uh, Force to Fork. And um, I learned a lot there, and I kind of just um, kept going with my interest in mushrooms. And I had, again, already kind of had a previous interest. So, um, yeah. This is the abstract here. I don't know if you guys got to read that. Uh, I'll just kind of summarize it a little bit. So uh, we know Cubensis as a psychedelic mushroom known for producing hallucinogenic compounds. And uh, as these compounds and the regulations around them become more relaxed and allow more scientifically backed research and recreational use, it's imperative to have a better understanding of how we can cultivate these mushrooms in uh, sound, sterile methods. Um, doing so, you know, we can produce large amounts of fruits and small amounts of space and, um, and uh, a variety of methods. So a little, this is just a little roadmap for, uh, sorry, I don't think I got that clicker yet. Um, it's just a little roadmap about, you know, how the, the discussion is going to kind of uh, unfold. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is Cubensis. Uh, how has it impacted us historically? Why is it important? And then really dive into how can we cultivate it or the optimal conditions for cultivation. So a little background on Cubensis. It's a eukaryotic fungi. So it's a eukaryote. It has a, a nucleus that, uh, a, a nuclear envelope that wraps its chromosomes. Um, it's in the Domain Basilio Mycata, which is one of two uh, domains of higher fungi. Uh, the class <clears throat> is um, a little difficult to pronounce there. I'm going to try my best here. Agriocomycetes. And the order is Agriocales with the family Hymenogastraceae, uh, for anyone who's interested in the taxonomy of things. Uh, so it is a saprophytic mushroom, meaning it feeds off of dead organic plant waste and matter. Um, so it's a huge part of the ecosystem, great for uh, composting and breaking down <clears throat> um, materials that you know we want to restore into the soils and uh, create available uh, plant nutrients and also uh, nutrients for the mushrooms. So a little bit about the uh, Bicidio micata domain. They're classified by filamentous shape, and uh, they reproduce via specialized spores known as Bicidio spores. And we'll just uh, refer to them as spores during this conversation here to make it a little easier. So this is a diagram on the life cycle. I'm just going to kind of briefly go over some key points here. Um, we can, we can see the fruit, uh, also known as the basidio carp, up at the top there, uh, in a dihaploid stage, I'm sorry, dikaryotic stage, which is uh, two nuclei in one cell. Um, and then they undergo a phenomenon known as choragamy, uh, which is the joining of these two nuclei within these uh, specialized basidio cells, or basidio spores. They are typically wind dispersed, uh, land in <clears throat> uh, comfortable uh, or uncomfortable situations, and then depending on the conditions, germinate. And you have your primary, your formation of your primary mycelium. Uh, and then within the primary mycelial mat, you'll have your uh, 
positive and negative or um, compatible connections uh, between different mycelium, which will form your secondary mycelium, leading way to the uh, dikaryotic, dieukaryotic stage again, and um, <clears throat> repeating the cycle. All right, so a little bit about how Cubensis has impacted us. Um, it's very prevalent. Uh, it has been used in ancient Aztec rituals uh, and is currently today being used in trauma therapies and has been used for a variety of uh, things in between those uh, within that time too. Um, it's a contributing member of the ecosystem, as I mentioned before, being saprophytic, breaking down unwanted uh, or unused dead plant material into available forms for plants and other aspects of the ecosystem. And uh, many people believe that, um, myself included, believe that uh, it has somehow uh, contributed to the conscious thought of humanity. And I think that's a very interesting theory that I'm not going to get too far into today because I'm here to talk about growing them, but I'd love to talk about it with anyone who would like to. Um, so why and for what? So again, ritualistic purposes. You know, we've grown them for, you know, shamans have harvested them and used them in rituals um, for, you know, spiritual guidance, you know, spiritual awakenings or um, people struggling with, you know, identity issues or, you know, all sorts of these things. Um, medicinal, that's kind of included. Um, you know, I was, uh, I've been listening to a lot of TED Talks and um, lectures <clears throat> about the newly, um, the new studies that are coming out behind uh, um, th the therapeutics behind it, right? So, um, right, so the therapeutics behind it being uh, these higher dosages usually um, are more beneficial to getting through like traumatics traumatic experiences so you're not you, you're not microdosing on these um, these levels you're, you're using higher dosages there uh, which also is kind of a recreational thing too I, I think medicinal and recreational use sometimes go hand in hand where people um, are using this recreational escape almost to unknowingly uh, treat themselves of, of uh, you know traumas or, or pain that they're going through <clears throat> Sorry if that was a little uh, confusing there. Uh, and then economic as well. Um, you know, margins on mushrooms are great. And not just cubensis, it's cul culinary mushrooms too. So uh, operation costs, uh, setup costs are usually pretty low and your uh, profits are pretty high. So getting started on growing, um, you're gonna wanna do a lot of research. You're, you're gonna wanna research, research, research. And you're gonna, you know, want to find out what's working best for you in your area. Are you doing, you know, what size are you gonna do? Uh, what cultivars are you gonna pick? Um, what substrates are you gonna use? And you know, we'll go into that a little bit more. But that's all research. And picking your location too is huge. You got to know where you're gonna be operating out of. So once you have your location and you've done your research, then you're better fine-tuned to figure out what equipment you need, right? Uh, your PPE, you, you know, that's that's going to be huge. Uh, sterility is huge in the cultivation of mushrooms, and you're going to hear me say sterile a lot. Um, you're you're going to want your ISO, you know, isopropyl. A 70% isopropyl is usually recommended, um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, spray bottles, scalpels, box cutters, uh, fans to move your air when you start fruiting hyperdermic needles uh, when you're inoculating grain bags or grain containers typically because they're going to be in sealed containers uh, sealed sterilized containers and you're going to want to have some sort of uh, sealable puncture uh, entrance there or microporous tape to uh, seal that up so you're not getting contamination after you inoculate <clears throat> and they and they can breathe and there's gas exchange um, so additional equipment. Um, if you're really if you're really trying to get serious with it, and you um, 
you uh, you want to be professional, you're going to want to have a, a flow hood. You can usually buy flow hoods pretty cheap, actually used on eBay, um, $900 versus $1,500. Um, so definitely, you know, look look through your resources before uh, just making a, a large purchase. Um, still boxes, you can create your own. This is a little bit of a fancy one. I thought it was kind of overkill, uh, but it's made in a plastic tote and you can use similar designs for a lot cheaper than buying a professionally made still box. Uh, and then shelves too. I like to recommend, you know, if you're doing a larger scale operation, get some shelves. Um, vertical farming is uh, a great use of space and um, a lot less clutter, right? You're, you, you just have more space to work in and it's a lot more organized. And the last thing I want to touch on is tents. Um, <clears throat> tents, I think, are a great way to create ideal conditions in uh, certain spots. So, you know, say you have a basement, but your basement is too cold and you want to, you know, figure out how to keep some heat in somewhere. Uh, tents are just a great way to create microclimates within climates. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the optimal growth conditions. Again, uh, at all points during an indoor cultivation, you're going to want to have sterile techniques, you're going to have sterile surfaces, and you're going to want to be sterilizing your tools and, um, you know, whatever, whatever other equipment or surfaces you're working on. Uh, for germination and colonization, you're going to want no to low light, uh, dark, dark spots. Um, High humidities, uh, <clears throat> so these humidities are, you know, you're not gonna keep your room at 95% humidity. That's, you're just gonna have water dripping from everything, but the, the bag, the sealed bag itself is gonna allow that. And what you wanna do is keep your relative humidities at least 50%. Um, a little higher temperature during the colonization period. Um, speed those metabolic, um, metabolic processes up a little bit. Um, no free air exchange. You don't want uh, changes in the gas levels until you're ready to fruit. Um, <clears throat> so for fruiting, you're gonna wanna introduce some light cycle. I've found that um, fruiting with light versus trying to fruit just in the dark, you uh, do end up with more fruits. Um, and your humidity is gonna be lowered a little bit because you want to encourage that, well, it's just gonna happen naturally through introducing the air exchange a couple times a day. And um, that evaporation too is, that is gonna be triggering the fruiting. That's also gonna get rid of some of that humidity. Uh, so some commonly used mediums, um, again, all the mediums that you use should be sterilized before you introduce any uh, spores or any sort of mycelium into them. Um, otherwise, you just run risk of growing contamination and uh, wasting your material. Um, so grain spawn for colonization. Uh, my favorites are uh, rye berries uh, soaked in a gypsum solution, but I know many people favor popcorn and uh, brown rice is also a, another one, and we'll go over a little fun technique with the brown rice in a little bit. Um, and then bird seed too. You can grow off of uh, sterilized bird seed as well. Um, again, I've always found that rye berries work the best for me. So it's all about you know finding what works for you. Um, for bulk substrates, this is when you're going to be mixing additional nutrients in for your um, <clears throat> nutrients and aeration in for uh, your fruiting conditions. So um, manure is huge, cow, horse, you know, there's a, a range of manures available. Um, again, it's going to you're going to want to sterilize it. Um, worm castings. Cocoa core, um, straw, and compost. So, when when you're making a bulk bulk cup, uh, excuse me, bulk substrate, uh, you're never going to use strictly just a manure or just a worm casting, because as soon as you hydrate those things, they're going to turn into mud, and you're not going to have any available chance of colonization. So that's why you introduce the cocoa core, or the vermiculite, or the straw, um, to sort of aerate those uh, cakes and allow the mycelium uh, proper conditions to uh, spawn. 
so some additional ingredients I mentioned uh, gypsum. Uh, it adds uh, some nutrition for the uh, mushrooms, and it also uh, acts as a pH buffer to kind of uh, keep those mediums at a comfortable pH for the mushroom while it's growing. Of course, vermiculite. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with vermiculite. Uh, but yeah, that's more or less just for aeration in this case. Uh, pretty popular in the um, uh, BFR cakes. Um, and uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then hydrated lime as well. Uh, that's just more, you'll see those on recipes. You'll see that added in recipes and that's uh, usually just for a pH balance. Uh, so your quality counts and that goes for your grain, your bulk substrate, um, anything that you're getting. Um, your quality counts. You don't. You can have if you if you use a poor cocoa and you incorporate it, uh, even if it's you know sterilized. If it has uh, residual materials that you know might not have been fully broken down, you're not going to get as uh, good of a result if you use a, a, a well processed and um, clean cocoa, right? So that also goes with your water. Um, my rule of thumb when you're using water, if you're not going to drink it, don't use it for your mushrooms. Uh, that's pretty simple there. Um, for sourcing material, the internet's a crazy place. You can literally find anything that you need to do this online. Um, the, you know, Eli mentioned uh, social media sites being a huge platform for discussion. Well, it's also a huge platform for uh, purchasing materials and purchasing genetics and trading genetics. Um, so, yeah, Reddit, uh, Instagram, these are all, you know, you just kind of have to start getting into the community if you're interested. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people are very friendly and welcoming and, you know, um, you can make some good connections. Uh, you can also, you know, if you're not comfortable going online, you can, um, and you have some way of getting genetic material. For your substrates, you can go to gardening stores or brewing stores. Brewing stores typically for your grains, um, gardening for your compost and your cocoa. And then home improvement stores for all your tools, like your box cutters, your, your totes, you know, whatever, your jars, whatever you decide you need. Um, you can usually find it at a home improvement store or a big box store. Um, so your genetics, this is going to be important. You want to make sure, you know, you're getting clean genetics, but that's, that's a little, that's, that's difficult to do, right? So, okay, there's about 60 plus varieties of cubensis. Um, first, you're going to want to pick what type of variety you want to grow. Um, there are levels of difficulty to growing some of these varieties. Uh, for example, golden teachers have often been um, known to be a lot easier to grow uh, than any albino strain. Uh, a lot of the albino strains present difficulties. Um, so also when you're buying them, again, with the contamination free, you, you don't necessarily know if you're getting a contamination free sp uh, syringe from the internet, right? So, by uh, doing some, if you're buying a multi spore, which is um, a collection, a liquid collection of spores from uh, you know, maybe even just one mushroom. However, all those spores are individuals, right? They're all going to kind of act as their own mushroom. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to isolate these and um, that's where your liquid culture comes in. So once you played out, you can see this image here. Let me see, I'll get that quicker. Okay, so you can see the image on the far right is um, plated out a clean plated out uh, microspore, or I'm sorry, multispore uh, syringe on auger. So you can see all the separate colonies kind of starting to form all nice white healthy mycelium. This is where you would go in with your uh, scalpel or your clean sterile tools under your flow hood, uh, <clears throat> take some of this uh, mycelium out and uh, add it into your liquid culture solution. I'll get into this in a little second here. Um, but I want to touch on this contamination. You can see on the other picture here, this is also a multi-spore syringe that's been uh, spread out on at auger. 
and you can see all the contamination around here. Now, sometimes if you're skilled, you can isolate healthy communities from uh, contaminated uh, spore syringes. Um, however, you know, you're gonna wanna be fairly technically skilled when you're doing those things. Um, so a little bit more on the isolating genetics. When you isolate the genetics, you're creating consistent results for yourself. You, you're, you're isolating a cultivar that you know what it does, you know it fruits prolifically, you know it colonizes fast. Um, you know, you're just making, making cultivation easy on yourself by working with more familiar genetics and consistent uh, genetics. So the kind of, uh, this is just like a little layout of how you might go about isolating your genetics. Um, first, you're gonna wanna select out of your bin. You usually <clears throat> pick uh, the healthiest, you know, or nicest looking fruit you have. You take a piece of that tissue culture, you put it in an auger, um, and then, you know, you create some sort of uh, bulk inoculation from it, whether it be liquid or um, on a, a bulk substrate and you fruit and select and repeat. And that's what's gonna narrow down your genetic pool. Uh, so for creating liquid cultures, liquid cultures are a great way to store uh, readily available mycelium uh, for uh, injecting or injection inoculations. Um, they typically consist of uh, a pressure cooked, so a sterilized honey and dextrose water solution <clears throat> which is just a nutrient-rich solution for the mycelium to feed off of uh, while it's in the syringe. So essentially, when you're making a liquid cult or a liquid culture too, you're just inoculating. Uh, you're doing an inoculation process, uh, and with inoculation processes, what it is is it's introducing the spores uh, or tissue culture to a steel, uh, sealed, sterilized grain. Um, and, you know, during this process, you're going to want to make sure your workplace is uh, uh, meticulously sterilized. All your tools are as well. Your airflow is low or you have some sort of still box or flow hood in use. Uh, that's just going to increase your chance of uh, avoiding contamination. Uh, so your incubation conditions, you're, again, going to want to keep about that's 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, excuse me, 50% uh, uh, relative humidity outside of the sealed container. And uh, it's, a, it's a game of patience and attentiveness, right? So you want to be paying. I usually recommend once they get to about 50 or 60% colonized, you bust those bags up, move those grains around, and um, let them recolonize. Uh, I've heard you know, I've heard uh, mixed reviews on that, but I've always uh, busted my grain bags up and found that I, I find that they uh, seem to colonize a little faster when I do that. Um, let's see. Uh, so for mixing your bulk substrates, after you have your, your grain bags inoculated, right, you're going to want to add your bulk substrate into there. So you're going to want to, you know, once it's 100% colonized, again, you're going to want to break it up and... Um, you know, create a sterile uh, container for your bulk sub. Um, add this uh, colonized grain into your bulk sub, and you kind of want to layer it. You know, we kind of treat it like a cake. Um, you do a little bit, a little bit of the uh, bulk sub on the bottom, and then a little bit of the grain, a little bit of the bulk sub, a little bit of the grain, and you try and uh, layer it with bulk sub at the end, almost like uh, what people might call a casing layer. Um, after you uh, mix your bulk sub, you're going to want to let it colonize again for about 10 days. And, you know, in optimal conditions, depending on your variety, it should be ready to go into fruiting by then. So fruiting, um, you're going to be introducing gas exchange. Um, it changes in the levels of CO2 that they're experiencing. Um, there's going to be evaporation. That's also going to be a trigger and light. Um, I, I, I think that light is an important part uh, for producing uh, more fruits than not. Uh, so it's very quick. You'll see pinning in like two to five days, um, depending on your variety. 
and they'll kind of start off as almost like little water drops on the surface. It'll almost look like you see a whole bunch of little water drops. Well, that's really your primordial tissue forming. And, um, you know, within, you know, another couple of days, you'll start to see the, the heads start to pin. And, uh, and then in about, you know, five to eight days after that, you're going to be harvesting fully grown fruits. Again, this is depending on the variety, but um, this is, you know, generally, you know, you can expect this from cubensis. Um, and then you can take these cakes and get multiple flushes from them. So sometimes they need to be rehydrated after a certain point. And uh, you can do this by either soaking them in water um, for, you know, a certain period of time. I, I like to do, you know, uh, about uh, two inches in the bins that I do. Excuse me. I don't like to fully submerge the cake. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. Um, but yeah, about a 12 hour soak. If I'm going to soak them, sometimes uh, I find that just misting over them again. Uh, is, is enough to trigger fruiting a second time or a third time. So for harvesting and storage, uh, you're going to want to practice some sterile SOPs. Um, yeah, uh, that's going to be huge um, because when you're going in there and harvesting and if you want to do uh, multiple flushes out of, you know, one monotub, if you're not being sterile before you open up those tubs, you're just introducing a, a huge amount of risk for contamination. Um, so it's important to, you know, wipe down before you go in, shower even, uh, possibly have, you know, a change of clothes on hand. Um, you want to store these fruits in a really dry area. You want the humidity to be less than 50% in this case um, because you want them to dry out and obviously not rehydrate and rot. Um, Long-term storage, probably, you know, you're safe uh, after they're fully dried, um, vacuum sealing them and then storing them in low temperatures at dark spots. You know, I have a lot of friends or people, you know, that I've talked to that uh, store it in freezers. I don't necessarily see the, um, you know, necessity in that, but uh, I, I would feel more comfortable storing it in a freezer if it was vacuum sealed rather than not. Um, so if you're going to do that, I would recommend you vacuum seal it as well. Okay, so a little bit about contamination. I've said contamination quite a bit. Um, so what is it? Uh, well, basically, it's unwanted, um, unwanted uh, bacteria or, you know, uh, uh, living organisms in your bulk substrate or in your cakes that are um, hindering your mushroom growth, right? They're trying to they're trying to uh, colonize and establish themselves over the, the mushrooms as well. So um, how do you prevent it? Again, you have to be sterile. That's huge. Um, and we'll go into a little bit, a few more uh, unique sterility tips in the next slide here, actually. Um, but mitigating spread, you know, that, again, it goes just having SOPs in place. You know, if you find a contaminated bin, you know, you seal it up, you take it out right away, you know, you wipe everything down, um, what have you, you know, uh, but you have to have these processes in place that you're actually going to adhere to and, and do otherwise, you know, you're just gonna, you're, you're gonna have a high risk of contamination. Uh, so I just wanted to point out this picture too. I don't know if it's very clear. I chose this picture cause I thought it was kind of fun. You can't really see the contamination too well, but, um, you see this strand of mycelium and a little nub almost. And th the bottom portion of the picture is the side of the tub actually. So this little mushroom has almost seemed to avoided the contamination. I don't know what it was, but you know, that in my mind, you know, it's avoiding the contamination and um, it's actually growing off the side of the bin, which is pretty cool. Okay, so some uh, sterility tips, right? Uh, UV lighting is huge. Uh, you know, if you have uh, UV lighting at your entrances, um, you know, that's definitely helpful. Uh, air walls as well, kind of, you know, the same concept as um, 
uh, the positive air pressure or, you know, a flow hood, um, you know, preventing any bacteria or contamination from coming into the room simply by uh, blowing it out before it can get in there. Um, and then 70% ISO is your friend. You want to use the 70% ISO because it has a lower evaporation rate than the 90%. Uh, so you have, you know, it's going to stick to your surfaces a little bit more. You're going to be able to clean your surfaces a little bit better with the 70% ISO than you would be with the 90% ISO. Um, so a little bit about costs. Everybody likes to talk about costs. Um, I'm not going to throw out really specific numbers here. Um, but, uh, you know, you, we want to mention the size of your operation and your technique. Those are going to be the two biggest things that are going to determine, um, how much you're going to be investing really. And, uh, the more space is most likely going to equal a higher cost, but that does not mean, um, you're going to reap a higher benefit, uh, because you have to consider your labor too. Um, you know, it's the uh, harvesting. Harvesting uh, pounds and pounds of mushrooms can be taxing work. And if you don't have a team to, uh, you know, and also not just the harvesting, it's the whole setting up process as well. If you don't really have a team um, built to handle the amount of labor that you're facing, you know, the size of the operation doesn't really matter at that, at that point. Okay, so let's talk about a few techniques or techs as people like to refer to them. So again, uh, touching on the uh, uh, brown rice, um, this was a fun one that my buddy actually recently introduced me to um, with Uncle Ben's uh, brown rice. And you can literally, it's, it's very cheap. Um, you go into the store and you buy this you know, $2 bag of ready to cook uh, brown rice. Uh, you snip the side um, after wiping it, you know, with, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, ISO or whatever. You want to have your, your tools clean as well. And um, you uh, inject your uh, sterile liquid solution into the, or down the side of the bag. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to stick it into the rice. You can just let it sit right on top. Seal the, the hole up with micropore tape. And... Um, yeah, let it colonize, really. This uh, person here kind of squeezed the top of the um, uh, bag here so you can see within it, you know, and it gave the, 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 the top a little bit of a breathing space. Okay, so uh, BFR cakes, brown rice flour cakes. This is basically taking brown, uh, brown rice, grinding it if you don't uh, just pre-purchase it as uh, brown rice flour and adding it um, to vermiculite. And I, I threw up a little recipe here if anyone's interested. Um, this is for making a one, one cake. Um, and this, this, these mediums can also be used for you know, a, a range of mushrooms, not just cubensis. I just want to throw that out there. Um, so yeah, you're gonna uh, wanna pressure cook or steam sterilize these uh, jar mixtures. And um, once these are all colonized, you typically fruit um, BFR cakes in what's considered a shotgun fruiting chamber. So it's almost like, you know, a mono tub uh, with a layer of perlite or some sort of uh, aerating surface uh, below that kind of allows that um, hydration and the uh, moisture to kind of resurface um, on the bottom layer there. And it's basically a modified monotub, the shotgun fruiting chamber. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about monotubs here. Uh, that's probably my favorite way to go about cultivating um, many different variations of monotubs. I, I, um, my favorite variation is the simple, the simplest one, which is uh, no holes at all. Um, it's you're, you're using the, the tub as it comes, um, and you're sim and you just fan two times a day, three times a day by hand. Um, that's a little, it's a little difficult when you have a whole bunch of stuff going on. So what you can also do, if you can see in the top left uh, corner here, is uh, manually aerate bins. Uh, by setting them up to, you know, air pumps and setting them up on timers for them to um, turn on, you know, twice a day, three times a day. Now with that, <clears throat> you're going to want to make sure that the air 
that the pump is pumping from is also, you know, clean or, or somewhat sterile. You know, you don't want to be pumping a whole bunch of contamination into your bins. Um, but that's part of part of the challenge, right? You know, finding out how to do that. So, so uh, some large scale cultivation, um, just ideas. You know, we kind of talked about it on the panel here. Um, I would love to see, you know, one of these days, uh, cubensis being grown in um, professional fruiting chambers out of blocks. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see, you know, some outdoor bed cultivation ideas. I think that would be really interesting in the future. Um, I don't think we talk about outdoor cultivation of cubensis as much um, as maybe we should. Um, and uh, yeah, again, with the fruitings in the, in the block bags, I just, I would love to see that happening. So um, yeah, there's still a lot to learn about, uh, you know, cubensis and, you know, that's why we're here, I think. And uh, I hope, you know, this presentation, you know, gave you guys, you know, a little bit of insight, if any, on, um, you know, cubensis and how to grow it and why it's important and why we should be here talking about it today. So thank you. If you guys have any questions, I'll take questions. Out of curiosity, feel free to say it's not my business, but is it safe to assume that you're probably cultivating? And if you are, to what extent is your cultivation? Well, currently it's not very large. Um, I have been involved with some larger cultivations. Um, you know, uh, about you know, 30, 40 bins or something like that. Um, currently, yeah, it's just kind of a small, small little hobby that I'm still doing, but um, yeah, I've, I've also seen some seen some other cultivation that I'm not necessarily a part of that were on those larger scales too. Uh, but yeah, they typically, I usually see, I mean, I've only seen uh, when it comes to doing, you know, bulk grows. So, yeah. Yeah, what are some ways you can make sure that your medians are being sterilized properly? Okay, so you can, um, well, one way is you can purchase them sterilized online. That's a huge way. Uh, but if you want to do it at home, um, I like to just do the steam sterilized method where I take a five gallon bucket uh, with a lid, like the five gallon Home Depot work buckets, the snap on lid. I uh, boil the appropriate amount of water in ratio to my substrates, how, many, how much substrate I'm adding. And uh, so I'm not adding too much water, right? Uh, boil the water, uh, pour it in, cover it with the snap-on cap and let it steam sterilize itself for about 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah, you just got to make sure your water's really getting up there and boiling. I have a second question. I understand the like, convenience of using plastics, but are you worried at all about that being contaminated as well? Um, the tubs? No, yeah, I mean, as long as you're taking the time to sterilize the tub before you're using it, right? So you're going to buy it from whatever store you're going to get it from. And you, you're definitely not going to want to just start dumping stuff in before, you know, spraying it with some ISO, wiping it down, spraying it again, wiping it down, probably spraying it again, wiping it down. And also, you're going to want to spray and wipe and clean right before you put your substrates in there because you know if you if you spray it and clean it and then come back to it three days later you know who knows what was you know walking by or what what fell in that bin on a microscopic level right yeah no problem you know, what scientific equipment uh, can you see being used to make this easier eventually to uh, help sterilize if anything you can think of um industrial sized autoclaves um, and yeah, just being able to use a lab setting, uh, without, you know, all the restrictions or, you know, just having access. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah. Autoclaves. Yeah. Chris might be someone you want to talk to about that. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I just, I don't know. I guess I'd like to, um, uh, 
see it being done on more of like a you know large scale level i i you know i don't know i've never i've never heard of anyone growing cubensis or psychedelic mushrooms outside i mean k in essence on the wood you know there's there's different um families uh but yeah i don't know i just i think like reduce reduced um input you know just like you're not worried about you're gonna have your season right you're gonna say okay this is the season i'm gonna go spread my my spore you know over the um you know the the area of bulk substrate that i choose to use and i'm just gonna sit there and watch my patch of mushrooms grow you know versus like you know um being but again i think that's gonna that's you know we got to look into uh maybe um coexisting relationships with other mycelium that allow it to do that without being overrun by contamination or other um you know mushrooms competing with it in the soil naturally so yeah just just thoughts just kind of putting those thoughts out there for people who you know might be interested in thinking about something like that what was that how do you ensure sterilization outside like you just do it in a greenhouse or just yeah i don't i mean that's the big thing about outside cultivation is how do you guarantee sterilization right you i mean it's not you're not really focused on growing in a sterile condition anymore you're focused on like growing in an uh in an uh, like a, a comfortable position for the for the the mushroom itself um you know what what can we do to help that mushroom survive in a place that it's going to encounter contamination or it's going to encounter those natural enemies if you want for for certain you know how can we help it uh, You good? Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, just curiosity. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. The avoiding uh, cross contamination is that really going to be more for being able to ensure the the life of the of, of the mushroom, or is it merely to avoid it being something that you don't want it to be? Essentially, like having some other biological. Yeah, I mean, you can still like. Is your question? Can you still grow the mushroom even if it's contaminated? Not as well. I guess that could be part of the question, but more so is, what are we doing by by making sure that there is no cross contamination? Are we ensuring the oh. life of the mushroom? Are we ensuring that we yes. get exactly what we want well, in terms of like biological material? Yeah, you're more or less ensuring the longevity of the mushroom, okay. right? And the the. Uh, productiveness of that mushroom and yeah i mean ultimately that's gonna you know affect your quality too you know if you're if you're growing around you know contamination or if you're harvesting off of cakes that are contaminated your mushrooms are definitely not going to look as as nice or as appealing um as you know mushrooms coming off of a nice healthy cake you know a nice uncontaminated cake after you harvested do you lose the after a certain time? Like um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I can't professionally test for that. You know, um, I will say out of, um, you know, anecdotal evidence, um, it, you know, usually if you have a solid variety, your variety will be, um, very potent, no matter, you know, all the way up into the end, it'll, it'll, it'll keep its potency it'll just lose um, its fertility it'll lose how much it can produce right so after a while it just stops producing as much but what it produces is generally um, the same quality what i've found from flush to flush yeah you might get some bigger fruits you know or some kind of wonky looking ones towards the end um, but when it comes down to chemical composition in my head i think you know it's generally the same out of the same cake if you're, you know, harvesting off the same cake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's going to, I mean, the size of it is going to affect, you know, the potency of that mushroom. But, it, you know, when you think potency, you want to think ratio, right? Within a certain amount of this, within a gram of material, how much of this do I have? How much of this do I have? How much of that do I have? And, um, yeah. Well, did I answer your question? I don't know. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think I forgot to mention that over in the harvest. Yeah. I, I, um, 
Yeah, I like to pick right before the, the veil falls uh, just because it avoids uh, sporing out the cake, which you can, um, when you introduce those spores, again, those spores are individuals. So you're basically introducing competition to your cake when you let those spores land and uh, potentially germinate. Not to say they're going to germinate because, you know, the, the variety has to be viable too, you know, but um, still mitigate your risk, right? Acceptance yeah. Um, you know, I usually do hot water extractions. You know, I'll make teas. Um, I don't. I'm. I'm not. You know, uh, in the position to. You know, do many like lab grade extractions. You know, um, but alcohol extractions too. You know, I, I always like hot water extractions. Though I think that's really the way to go. Um, yeah, well, it's a water soluble compound, exactly. So, you know, you literally heat the water, you put the mushroom in there, you let it sit, you don't even have to break them down. Um, and you strain it off, and then, you know, you keep it in your fridge. And, you know, I like to add uh, lemon and honey too. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, properly stored. I would say, you know, you're good for some years. I mean, if they're dried, they have to be dried fully, um, which, you know, you want them, you know, the kind of a rule of thumb there is you want them to crack when you bend them. You know, you want to hear them break. They want to be brittle. Um, but, yeah, after you vacuum store it, you know, um, you know, maybe freezing would probably, you know, last longer. But uh, all, all in all, vacuum storage, I think, is just, uh, you know, and, and under 50% humidity, too. You want to make sure that mushrooms are not rehydrating. That's a huge part, too. Yeah. So, would you store in the refrigerator? Yeah, the refrigerator. I wouldn't do the refrigerator. If you're going to store them in, in the fridge, you know, put them in the freezer, right, and, and make sure they're sealed. Uh, I wouldn't put, like, a Ziploc bag of mushrooms in the freezer because you're still going to run the risk of, you know, getting some sort of condens condensation or, you know, freezer burn even on the mushroom. Yeah. You might have actually mentioned this in the last uh, group that you were in, uh, but you mentioned the testing of potency. Is, is there any actual way to test potency at this very moment that's, easy, that's easily done? I, I believe... I believe there's uh, ways to do it. Yes, I don't know if it's easily accessible just because of the regulations around the compound, right? I think that's the big thing, yeah. But, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like they're obviously, you know, testing in some places for it, and I'm, I'm you know, guessing Colorado is a great place to start for it. So start looking for that information. Cool. All right, well. Any other questions? Yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up. Thank you guys. And it's been a pleasure and I really appreciate it.